I am an adjunct. I have a PhD from one of the best universities in the United States, and I've won teaching and research awards during my nearly 15 years in the profession. I actually have to remind myself of this because when you're underpaid and undervalued by the institution you work for, you begin to doubt your own qualifications. An adjunct is someone who's paid to teach college by the course and who can't plan past the current semester. This isn't what most Americans picture when they think about university professors, but more than 70% of the people who teach college in this country don't have tenured or tenure track jobs. And the problem is getting worse. If you have been to college, then there is a surprisingly high chance that someone who taught you was on food stamps. I'm not in this position as I'm married to someone who has a full-time job, but when I calculate the number of hours I put in each week for the course I'm teaching now, between reading, class preparation, emails, advising, grading, writing letters of recommendation, and actual class time, it comes to about $3 an hour. My parents are from two different countries, and my father was in international business and got transferred somewhere new every few years. This made me very mobile. I grew up in five countries and learned to speak four languages fluently as a kid. I was an only child and found a lot of happiness in books, which taught me another kind of mobility. So I thought becoming a professor of romance languages and cultures would be a natural continuation of the life I'd always known. I went to graduate school in French, dreaming of a career filled with travel, cosmopolitan scholars, and students who were curious about other peoples and civilizations. If you had told me in those days that I would be living out in middle America, more than a thousand miles away from anywhere I knew well, teaching literature as a highly disposable adjunct instructor at a university whose traditional strengths are its business and engineering schools, that I would be standing in front of a room of computer science, exercise science, and petroleum engineering majors trying to convince them of the value of literature, I would have tell, told you, that sounds like hell. <laughs> now, if you had asked students from these majors what they thought about having to take requirements in the humanities, many would probably have responded in the same way. I was looking at my class roster as this semester started, and I noticed that nearly all my computer science and engineering students had waited until their very last semester of college to take that dreaded humanities requirement. The last remaining hurdle between them and what they surely expect to be lucrative careers in their fields. No doubt, too, they see their university's use of adjunct faculty to teach core courses such as mine. They see that I don't have a permanent office of my own. They learn that I don't have health coverage and other basic benefits. They discover how few permanent faculty are on staff to cover the entire curriculum. And they begin to have a sense of how much actual value the institution has for the humanities. So it's not surprising that they begin to wonder why they should be any more invested in what happens in my classroom. Let me tell you about a student I taught several years ago when I was still in graduate school. This young African-American woman had grown up on her father's farm in Mississippi and was the first person in her family to go to college. This was a big deal, not only for her family, but for her entire hometown. And it made her terribly frightened of failure. She was one of the hardest working students I have ever had, but she found herself in her first year of college in a state of panic at the prospect of four required semesters of a foreign language. During several meetings with me, she confided that she didn't think she'd be able to master a lot of grammar, and learn a lot of vocabulary in French. <clears throat> she was afraid she would earn low grades and jeopardize her chance to attend graduate school or even risk her status as an undergraduate. 
She was also rather shy and was not thrilled about the emphasis on active participation in class. En français seulement, in French only, of course. But she persisted. And she not only exceeded her own expectations about how much French she would, earn, she would learn, she went on to earn A's in all four required courses, but she went on to declare a minor in French language and literature. She is currently in her final year of law school at Harvard, where she specializes in international human rights law. She plans to devote her career to defending victims of human trafficking in Francophone countries in Africa. And much of this work will be in French. Another student, a white student from Kansas, took a comparative literature course with me called Beyond the Nation State, the Literature and Culture of Migration, in order to fulfill her core humanities requirements. In the process of reading the Jamaican writer Earl Lovelace's novel, The Dragon Can't Dance, and the Ethiopian-American writer Dina Mengestu's novel, The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears, she began to understand how colonialism and capitalism had created long legacies of racial and economic inequality in the New World. Her papers, which turned out to be very good, addressed the intersection of race, class, and nationality, and their impact on the migration experiences of these characters in the novels. She now plans to be a medical doctor, caring for people in underserved communities in the United States, particularly immigrant communities. I also taught a chemical engineering major from rural Oklahoma who connected the concept of cultural hybridity she learned about by reading Leslie Marmon Silko's novel, Ceremony, to the process of molecular hybridization she was studying in her own major. I had two Chinese computer science majors who became interested in representations of Islam in a novel by a Senegalese writer. They presented their research to the class I'm teaching now. And another of my students is a young man from Saudi Arabia who came to the United States to study petroleum engineering and who plans to return to his homeland to work in the oil business when he graduates. He wrote compellingly about the mistreatment of women in Desirada, a novel by Marie Condé, a French Caribbean writer from the island of Guadeloupe, whose fiction explores the lives of colonized, marginalized, and economically victimized peoples. I don't know where these insights will take my students. Humanities doesn't guarantee a quick return on investment. This type of learning defies simplistic definition and can't be quantified in the short term. But it offers a space in which students can explore the interconnectedness of our world. The wildly different experiences shared by people in many periods and places. The ever surprising newness of seeing the world through the eyes of others. This is the best kind of interdisciplinarity, as it teaches students to assemble the world in a way that keeps human beings at the center of everything else. Sure, I work hard to teach my students to be good writers. I teach them how to be analytical readers, to understand how novels work in terms of narrative perspectives and literary devices. And in the process of reading literature, in its social, cultural, and historical contexts, they are able to connect what we are reading to the real world. When I teach, I model the type of curiosity and passion I hope my students will have. I do a great deal of learning in my own classroom, both through my encounters with the novels we read and with my students, who come from so many different cultural and disciplinary backgrounds. And it's a privilege to be present and observe my students becoming smarter. One of my favorite quotes comes from a teaching evaluation a student wrote anonymously, which said that my class forced critical thinking that cannot simply be Googled. 
This is what I mean when I say that literature helps us see beyond ourselves. Now, if we could just get universities to hire me and people like me and to respect the thousands of adjunct instructors as the dedicated professionals we are, our system of higher education would have a sustainable model for the future. An investment in these people is an investment in our students and in our humanity.